Hello, good evening. I'm Colin Ford from Dock and Roll TV. Thanks for joining us tonight for Upstairs Planet Q&A. Uh, we've been streaming the film exclusively on Dock and Roll TV for the last couple of weeks, and we've had a great, enthusiastic response from all over the world. We've had viewers from 17 different countries, including Brazil, Japan, Poland, Estonia, Germany, Norway, US, and the UK, of course. We're delighted to have the film's director here tonight for Q&A. Graham Bendel is a British writer and filmmaker. Previous films of his have included Derailed Saints, a film about Vic Goddard and Subway Sect, and Billy Childish is Dead, uh, another film of his, which was nominated for a British Independent Film Award. Tonight, hosting the Q&A is Zoe Howe, a music author, artist, and sometimes musician. Zoe has written many acclaimed music biographies, uh, ones on The Slits, Jesus and Mary Chain, Polystyrene, and Wilco Johnson, to name but a few. Um, I'll just give you a little rundown of how the chat's going to go. I'm going to play a trailer to set the scene for the film now, and then we're going to have about a 20-minute chat between Zoe and Graham, followed by 10 minutes questions from the audience. So make sure you put your questions in the Facebook comments, and we'll pass them on to Zoe. So uh, then we're just going to wrap the whole thing up with a couple of... Graham's favourite tunes from the Cleaners from Venus, Factory Boy, and a song for Sid Barrett. So just bear with me while I set up the trailer, and then we'll go straight into the Q&A after the trailer in about two minutes' time. Once upon a time, a young boy had a dream. Father, I'd like to join a pop group. What? Well, what about your army career and the sheep farm? Well, well... Get out of my bloody sight, you effete fop! And so the boy joined a glam rock band. Michael, does this blouse match my lipstick? I've seen worse, love. But the music biz is no place for sissies. I can't deal with these lying, thieving bastards. I'm going to buy a porter studio, form a DIY pop group, and become the godfather of lo-fi. Then there was Miriam, the love interest. Oh, Martin, it's lovely. I just adore your sloppy double tracking. <laughs> and there were the small victories. Hey, Martin, you're number one in these psychedelic charts on Radio Moose Dog. Wow, I'm going out to buy a Paisley shirt. Directed by Graham Bendel, a film about Martin Newell and the cleaners from Venus. Upstairs planet, you'll never want to come back down. That is correct. Take it away, guys. Fantastic. Excellent stuff. Welcome to the Upstairs Planet Cleaners from Venus and the Universe of Martin Newell Q&A uh, with Doc and Roll and me, Zoe Howe. And uh, the film, of course, was directed, edited, everything by the lovely Graham Bendel. Hello, Graham. Hi there, Zoe. How, How are you are doing? You? <laughs> <laughs> Your hair's looking lovely this evening, by the way. Oh, thank you. That's very kind, very kind. It's a bit fluffy, but... Uh... We'll have to press on it's regardless. It's beautifully. Um, and uh, as, as Colm said earlier, the, the, the film is, of course, streaming on Dock and Roll TV. I think you've got one more day to watch it. But I, I imagine that most of the people uh, watching this Q&A have probably already uh, taken the chance to do that. Um, and if you haven't, I, I'm going to try and minimise spoilers throughout our chat. Um, but it is a very special film uh, about a very special personage. Um, so I just wanted to sort of start things off, Graham, with um, with asking you what kind of drew you uh, first to sort of make a film about Martin Newell. Well, the thing is, I'd, I'd made two films. I made one about Billy Childish and uh, Vic Goddard, and I was looking for a third project, and nothing really came to me so I was like really you know just looking at all the options but nothing seemed right and uh, so I wasn't even sure I was definitely going to make a third one but I did want to and one day I just happened to be in Reckless Records up in Soho 
and there was some music that was playing on the stereo and I don't usually do this but I said you know excuse me what what is this song and the person said well that's um, a band called Cleaners from Venus and I hadn't I'd kind of heard the name and then a bit well actually the next song he played was something that was equally brilliant but very different and I kind of thought it was a different band and I said and I don't usually do this at, at all and I said you know what what what's this track as well and he said well that's Cleaners from Venus it's the same album and I was thinking hang on a minute these two songs are really different but they're brilliant they, they kind of sound like different bands and after that I just thought you know I'll do some I'll find out about the cleaners from Venus and obviously that led me to Martin Newell because he's the constant um throughout the whole cleaners from Venus uh recording career and I, I just thought I want to make a film about this bloke because I just couldn't understand how the, these songs could be so brilliant but no one you know no one I talked to really that not that many people really knew of them so I just thought you know what I I, I want to find out about this person and I want to speak to him and then I just got to speak to him and I thought right I'm, I'm going to make a film about you that's it there's <laughs> that's yeah that's what I did really that's and, the best motivation for for any project like this it's like you know I just I want to know more you know where is the film where is the book you know sometimes you just gotta you gotta do it yourself it's you know the classic DIY punk thing I suppose isn't it it's that same spirit but I mean you mentioned your previous uh, films obviously Derailed Sense just a, a, a lovely film as well Billy Childish is Dead um but it's all maybe you know what is the driving force behind your choices of subject I mean would you say there's a characteristic between all of these kind of different subjects that that, that kind of that is um kind of links them together or is it something that kind of crops up almost without you realizing you think oh I can see there's something linking these subjects together yeah well the the thing <laughs> the thing is um just being I, I want to make a film about someone who's you know say for want of a better word you know a cult artist an outsider artist but just being an outsider artist or being a bit under the radar, it's not really good enough. They've got to have, um, I think that there's got to be a story behind, you know, their music. And with the story, there's got to be universal themes that kind of reach out to people so that even if you don't know anything about the band, the film, the film that I make has got to be accessible to an audience. So you're going to have these universal uh, universal themes that resonate with people, you know, and the themes can be, you know, love, they can be thwarted ambition, they can be drugs, they can be parent, um, parent, uh, parental problems, um, all kinds of things. Uh, but, yeah, I, it, they, that, that's an important thing in the, fi in, in the film to have uh the, the, that kind of accessibility I, I don't want it to just be for people in the know I just don't want a kind of a muso crowd coming along and, and a lot of the time in my films uh people come up to me and say Look, I didn't know anything about that artist and um you know I just want to buy everything that they've ever made and I really enjoyed it and and to me that kind of signifies why I made the film in the first place and the other thing that I don't want to do, I don't want to make a film where kind of old people are discussing punk. I think actually, the, I mean, a lot. the first two projects had a kind of quite strong punk themes. Mm. And I just wanted to get away from punk a little bit. And I, th I guess I was a bit punked out. And um, But on, on saying that, I think um, Martin Yule's obviously got a kind of punk spirit, but it's not really, you know, it's not really about that anyway. It's about... I mean, it's got the obvious DIY and the fiercely independent thing going on. But I, I yeah, I think I think that it was uh, kind of different from the other things that I did. Definitely. And and you're right, you know, projects like this, if they're done right, they are a kind of a portal into that person's world and, and they should be as accessible to someone who, who is completely new to them uh, as, as it is to someone who's a real enthusiast. And I think you really got that, that you know, the balance was really beautiful, I thought. Um, and, and the thing that comes across as well 
is Newell is is very much sort of wonderfully defiantly himself you know as you say he's very much an outsider artist it's very inspiring to kind of hear him talk and and, and learn more about his his life and his work um, but there's also this sense of conflict and frustration in a way at, at sort of being as he as he put it I think not understood uh, and and Lol says as well in the film that he you know uh, that Martin uh, so wished he, he was understood and recognized more and was this did this come as a surprise to you? Um, well, not so much a surprise, but it kind of, it reinforced and it confirmed that, that I should be making a film about this person, um, because this person, I think when, when you're that ridiculously talented and, you know, I, I think he's like kind of effortlessly gifted, it just seems like an injustice and a tragedy that when you're not recognised for that kind of amount of talent, mm. not to say he's gone through his life by you know completely being ignored because he hasn't but I really think he hasn't been paid his dues I, I just think um he's, he's so uh he's done so many he's so prolific and he's done so many great songs and he's done so many other things like you know poetry and writing that he really should be you know in the Guardian or the Observer or the Times you know every other week really you know and, and he's um he's not but um yeah that kind of made me think um I've made the right choice in in my subject but on the other hand uh maybe I'm not maybe you know maybe I'm surprised he said that because he he he's someone who's kind of self-sabotaged so much that he hasn't played the game and you know he he hasn't kind of done the things he should do I guess you know one of the obvious things is he never really played and you know he, ne he never really gigged incessantly like a lot of bands and you know if you're not if you're not really gigging that's going to really affect um your notoriety you know people aren't going to kind of hear about you and especially when you know you start off for a lot of your career not doing albums you know you're putting out out records on cassette so you know there's only a certain amount of people are going to really hear about you so yeah, I mean, he and also he's kind of quite, yeah, he's quite defiant and he's quite um, quite a spiky character. So he hasn't really, I think he's upset a lot of people in the industry in the past and he hasn't done the right things. So I suppose, yeah, yeah, I'm kind of surprised and I'm not surprised. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose because it came across to me that, you know, I guess maybe that's that sort of fantasy of how kind of really kind of, independent eccentric mavericks uh think you know we just think they're just they're not going to care about that stuff they're too busy making art it's fantastic but of course there is you know there's always going to it's complex isn't it there's always going to be something inside that's like you know it would be quite nice if if some people maybe got it a bit more and and you know so it's kind of interesting it's very it's a very honest film i think and i think yeah. you know, sorry yeah i mean i i think yeah when you're that when you're as prolific as um martin is um, you know, you can be as kind of spiky and idiosyncratic as you want, but at the end of the day, you you will have a kind of ego, and you you will want that to be fed, and you will want people to kind of acknowledge what you've done. And um, yeah, and I, I think he he is he does want acknowledgement, and uh, you know <laughs> he deserves it because he's he's just. Um, written the most amazing songs he's so uh, he's such a prolific songwriter and he's much kind of um, you know it's, it's a lot of people kind of pigeonhole him in that kind of cult category but he's the writing's just superb it's um, trying to I mean it's like lots of people I mean I guess Robin Hitchcock but then it, it's you know Paddy McLoon from Prefab Sprout in a way um, Bill Nelson, all sorts of people, um, but yeah, yeah, absolutely uh, a, a great, great talent, and um, I kind of felt really lucky that I stumbled upon um, Martin and the Cleaners from Venus, and I just kind of think, and it scares me a little bit, I think if I wasn't in Reckless at that moment, at that time, and I didn't hear that song, you know, I, I, I might not have made this film. I mean, I might have heard them at some time down the line. Um, and also, I kind of think as well, how come I never really heard them? Because they just seem so obviously good. 
like you know I, li- I like all the bands like television personalities subway sects and i don't know desperate bikes because all sorts of kind of bands but why did it take so long for me to to kind of get into them yeah <laughs> Yeah, it's just, it is interesting how these things come together and so much is about timing and, and serendipity as well. But it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, there's definitely kind of parallels to be drawn, I think, um, you know, between the artists that you choose to make your films about and, and, and certainly Martin Newell, you know, uh, between that, that sort of lo-fi uh, creativity and, and the way you make your films. And I, I like the, the fact that it's, it's not about kind of, you know, nice, smoother excuse me, nice smooth edges and it's the beauty is kind of in, in the fissures and the cracks and there's, there's usually a kind of underpinning of uh, self-deprecating wit and it's very honest and it's, it, it's, it's just got this kind of interesting lo-fi charm and eccentricity in. and I think that there are these disarmingly human moments in your film where, um, I mean, those of, uh, those of you watching will have already seen but I won't do too much of a spoiler but, uh, you know, the guitar and the brick moment, I'll just put it that way, and all the sort of the openness about who didn't want to be involved and didn't want to be interviewed. I mean, you talk a little bit about that, because those are often the sort of the cracks that people try and paper over. Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, I, I, the way I make films is um, I, I don't have a production company. I don't have a producer. I don't have a lighting cameraman. I don't have an editor. I don't have anything. Um, so essentially I don't have anyone telling me I can't do something so and and I have full editorial control and in some ways that's kind of probably a little bit unhealthy but I guess what I do is I, I, I put the stuff in the film that most producers would say no you, you shouldn't do that you shouldn't put that in or that's a bit indulgent or it's a bit kind of silly or it's a bit kind of unprofessional so if I did have a producer, they probably would take that stuff out. But to me, the, the, the thing I like about the films is all those things that probably shouldn't be in there make the film and, and they're kind of quirky. And um, I actually include a lot of mistakes. I don't take mistakes out. And I think that's kind of gives it a slight a, a kind of vulnerability and a fragility, which makes it very human because, you know, it's a, it's a human being I'm making a film about and I'm a human being making a film I'm not a robot and mistakes are kind of very human so yeah I'm very proud of those things and in fact there was one time because uh, I, I did have <laughs> I've got a kind of technical guy who goes over the stuff and he there was a glitch at one point where it repeats something and it was in there for so long and when he kind of went over the stuff just to try and you know make things a little bit better um he actually took that glitch away and I, and I made him put it back in because mm. it just didn't feel right taking it out because it had been there for like I don't know you know seven or eight months that I've been editing and I didn't know how to get rid of it <laughs> so I just <laughs> liked it being there so yeah my, my stuff's kind of got all kind of flaws and 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 mistakes and sound problems and visual problems and and yeah it's a, it's kind of lo-fi that's the nature of the beast and uh, I think it's done in sympathy with the artist and in that way because the artists that I make films about are very unapologetic about what they do and how they make music so I I feel similarly unapologetic about making the films the way I do um apart from sometimes uh, when they're about to scream I do give the uh, projectionist a nightmare <laughs> that's not the matter <laughs> but no, it's, it's so, I, so, so I, say, I say I say like I don't you know I don't care but sometimes yeah, I do care about you know things as well I suppose yeah. it's keeping all these things in balance is it like everything but but as you as you say you know often those those little kind of quirky moments that just sort of give you a little jolt and oh, what was that you know that those are the, the things that we we sometimes remember with the most affection about about films like this as well I think you know um it, it's very much of the spirit uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um that kind of sense of place that really crops up in the film and there's one point where Martin is talking about that magical kind of Essex East Anglian landscape and he says um I belong to it and it's this really quite sort of 
quite a sort of quietly potent moment, I think, and it's something that really does come over. And I, I always think that estuarine landscapes do often produce quite sort of eccentric, uh, interesting, independent uh, characters. Maybe it's something in the water, I don't know. But uh, I mean, h how important is that sense of place in the music and, and in Martin's writing and, and his character? Well, I think kind of location is important because, like, you know, Bowie wouldn't have made heroes low and lodger if he was living in milton Keynes or st john's wood instead of berlin but in another way i think martin wherever he was plonked you know on, on, he'd naturally be very kind of prolific and he'd want to produce art because that's his nature and in in, in some ways there's a, there's a part of the film where it says that he lives where he lives is actually inside his own head. But in, in another way, I think, um, you know, maybe because of his condition, which I won't kind of go into, his mind is probably, I think it's very active. It's very kind of, it can be quite um, frantic and disordered. So, so maybe he does need the serenity and the beauty uh, and, and the calmness of his surroundings. Maybe that kind of feeds into um, the creative process where maybe that makes him happier, makes him feel um, better to, you know, better equipped to, to be prolific and and happier to kind of make the, the music and the writing and the poetry and, 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 and everything he does. So, yeah, so that, that, I mean, that's a really interesting question. And I, I don't know if I've, I've kind of answered it properly, but yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's interesting about, you know, when he said where he lives is actually in his head. And of course, that's a brilliant a brilliant answer uh, and but I suppose that those kind of those big flat kind of East Anglian landscapes and the beautiful water you know you, you almost need all that space around you when you've got so much going on in in your head you need that balance to actually maybe maybe create I don't know but well, no, no, absolutely absolutely I, I I think that that's right I think it, it he needs that serenity he needs that kind of proximity to you know nature and the sea and the whatever um so yes so I, th I think yeah, I don't think it. Maybe it's either or, but mm. I think there's a bit of everything in there. Like the location doesn't affect him, but then it completely affects him. So yeah, it's <laughs> it's complex. Yes. Yeah. No. Very. Um. I mean, your, your film really kind of shows a person who I think is hugely likable and 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 really humble. And I think it's someone you kind of warm to and want to listen to. That was certainly my experience as a, as a viewer. Um, but I mean, what was your experience of, of making the project with, with Martin on a kind of personal level? Was it was it kind of a quite a sort of changeable ride? I mean, these things always are, I know. But um, I, I think making the film with uh, Martin was, it was really good. It was a real pleasure because uh, the other films that I made, they took about five years each. And with Vic Goddard, there were solicitors involved. And with Billy Childish, um, it, he, you know, he's quite a formidable person. And um, we, there was a lot of arguing. There was a lot of, um, yeah, uh, I mean, <laughs> there was a period when Billy kind of made it, he'd like to sort of tell me various things about myself. Like um, he'd phone me up and say, you know what, Bendel, you're the most conniving, manipulative, scheming person I've ever met. And then the next night he'd phone up and say, you know what, Bendel, you're very much like Dougal from Father Ted. And I think, well, hang on a minute. If I'm conniving and scheming and manipulative, how can I be like Dougal from Father Ted? You know, as a contradiction <laughs> in terms. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it was very kind of with uh, the Billy Childish documentary. Um, that was about five years, which were really intense. And there was a lot of arguments. But also, you know, things went well as well. But I mean, we fell out for a long time. But in a funny sort of way, with Martin, because we were getting on so well, I kind of thought that lack of tension might be negative for the documentary. But I, I, I don't, I don't think that was the case because the documentary was kind of about about other things and and. It, it wasn't really about there wasn't it didn't matter if you could perceive a sort of like underlying tension between the filmmaker and the artist that wasn't anything to do with it so with martin um he, he was just really really cooperative and i know that in his younger days 
he was very he was well known for being very difficult very spiky and uh, you know a bit of a nightmare and he he wasn't like that really apart from the fact he did shout at me one time but that's because he had a cold and uh, I was like taking like a hell of a long time to set up a <laughs> shot and <laughs> being a you know I deserved it basically so um end of his yes life. <laughs> yeah so <laughs> Yeah, mm, so it was, it was a whole different experience uh, making a film about Martin than it was making a film about uh, Vic, uh, Billy and Vic Goddard. That's a kind of, <laughs> that was a bit of a crazy sort of situation. But yeah, yeah, different. Mm. I'm not, I, I was going to say, should I ask about the, the I mean, you've, you mentioned the solicitors thing with Vic Goddard. Is that something we can't, we can't talk about? Can I ask what that well, was about? Yeah, you, you can ask about it. It was just that me and Vic Goddard got on really well and you know I made the film and then um his camp perceived it as being a bit derogatory about him or negative about him or like I was having a dig at him <laughs> and it was totally not the case oh hang on a minute you've seen it yeah, no absolutely. very affectionate yeah absolutely it, it was totally affectionate it was totally the opposite and it, it and the, and it, you know his camp were trying to make out it was some kind of hatchet job or something and, you know, it showed at the BFI um, at one point and, uh, and members of his band came up to me and said, you've really got it, you, you know, you've got Vic right, you really nailed the, him and it's not nailed in a bad way, but, you know, you've got him right and it, the film is so, you know, it, it's really affectionate and um, no one could understand what the problem had been because there weren't really very that many cuts that I had to make to it. Well... <laughs> there was a couple of things I had to take out but um yeah I mean hopefully as well I'd, I'd like to get that that film derailed sense shown as well mm. at some point uh when you do these projects that you know you you know people like yourself and myself we, we, we go into these things because we want to celebrate someone you're not going to put so much time and energy and love into something uh that you're probably not getting paid for or not maybe not getting paid very much for if you if you're going to do a hatchet job and I think Sometimes people sort of are very suspicious of the motivations of, of people who do these things. Most of the time, it's just because we love them. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly, exactly. I mean, you'd have to be like pretty deranged to spend that amount of time when you're not like going to make mega dollars just yeah. to like do a hatchet job of someone who's kind of, you know, got like a, a an appeal and a cult appeal, but he's not like... <laughs> you know it doesn't have like mil you know 100 million fans or something like that so yeah yeah you yeah. when you make a film you, you it's going to be pretty much um pretty positive absolutely i think if people knew what it took to make a project like this they would you know you assume you had uh, the artist's best interests at heart i think but um i mean was there anything you would have done differently uh you know looking back on the project um well I'm really happy with the film and uh and you know everyone's come back and they really really like it and um lots of people you know come up to me in, in, after a screening and they say oh it made me cry it was really moving and and I you know I kind of love that but I think one thing I was thinking but I, I couldn't really fit it in I, I just felt that I didn't really kind of nail how great he is lyrically and like his lyrics but you know obviously we established he's a great poet mm. and he's a great writer and he writes brilliant songs but um in fact you know could could I just read you some lyrics or maybe I can uh, remember them off the top of my head uh, a song called Mercury Girl I mean the, the lyrics are just incredible um she's building me up and then she's knocking me down like a factory chimney in a northern town and now I am demolished she is my mercury girl it's like you know what what a great lyric that is and it's really unusual com you know comparing him to a um you know a chimney being demolished yeah and but that, that, that's the that's the thing I mean lyrically he, he writes so brilliantly about relationships and difficulties and um complications um in, in relationships and unrequited love and all those kind of things um like there's a, a lyric um in uh, the song follow the plow um i follow her like a seagull follows the plow which is a, such an odd lyric as well just to sort of show about 
you know, I guess, you know, unrequited love or the, the, or the way um, someone's into someone and they're not into that person. His lyrics are just absolutely, you know, top notch. They're, they're fantastic. So yeah. I kind of, if yeah, if there's a regret, I kind of feel that I didn't explore the lyrical side enough. But then again, I would have, it would have changed, it would have created a bit of it. An, uh, imbalance to the film and I and I think the film was just perfect length and it kind of dealt with everything in a kind of good way I say perfect there's nothing really perfect about it because it's quite re- erratic and you know lo-fi and not chronological and you know it doesn't have a linear narrative but you know people like seem to like it so yeah yeah and, and, there's a, and the thing is that there comes a point where you you have to stop don't you you just have to get the film out and especially with a film you know you you have a length you you, you know with, with a book you can sort of go go on as much as you can sort of within reason but with a film you do have a sort of finite kind of thing yeah, you're aiming yeah. for you can't do everything can you uh, actually that that was a problem with uh, the whole kind of derailed sense of it goddard thing because his camp said well look you made this film but you've left out this you've left out that you've left out that that thing there this period here and and i said well look i can't make a film about your wikipedia entry because that would be like 26 hours long (laughs) i've only you know it's essentially like an introduction to the artist or a portrait Mm -hmm. of the artist yeah so yeah you do have a finite amount of time so you can't fit everything in it's it's your expression as well you know the way you're tying it together is that's your choice as well so there's, there's so many different kind of things that feed into these these projects that make them interesting I think but um I'm aware we're, that time is marching on um so but we do need to talk about sheep noises Graham <laughs> <laughs> well I, th- I think um yeah we had Martin's got a thing about uh he, he like in in the past he liked to try and get sheep noises on his records and it kind of did make me chuckle a little bit because um, when he recorded an album with Andy Partridge of XTC, um, he wanted to put a sheep noise on a record and Andy Partridge kind of vetoed it. It was like, you know, whatever, don't be so silly. We're not having your sheep noise on a record. And it just made me laugh because like Martin secretly imported like a, a, a sheep toy or something. And he, he managed to get the sheep noise like in the background on the record eventually unbeknownst to Andy Partridge <laughs> so I felt obliged with, with my film um to get a sheep noise in there somewhere and there is one in fact it, the sheep noise fell off the film at, at various points so I had to make sure it was back in there and uh yeah so the sheep noise is uh, really important um crucial sheep noise and I love that that's that's hilarious. Um, and and finally, um, before I have got some questions, of course, from uh, viewers as well. So I'll move on to that uh, momentarily. But final question from me. Um, what is next for you? What are you working on at the moment? Have you got another project in the, in the boil? Well, <laughs> um, I, I've actually been offered quite a lot of things, uh, documentaries to do. And um, but, you know, I'm not quite sure what what I can do or what's right for me so I'm having a think about it but at the moment nothing's going to be really made right now because of the pandemic yeah. but during this pandemic I've managed well I've started writing a novella but the other thing I've done which is really odd I've actually invented um, a quiz show a quiz program and this is either the best quiz program ever invented or it's actually the worst quiz show <laughs> ever invented and I don't think anyone's going to know until I start really pitching it. But I've been kind of on Twitter occasionally trying to engage Richard Osman, you know, from Pointless in mm. conversation. So he'll say something like, um, yeah, the the new album from Run the Jewels is really good. Uh, it's a really great album. And I'm like, yeah, thanks for the recommendation. Um, but I've actually made a really good, I've invented a really good quiz show and you might be interested in it. And it's much better than Number Wang or Bamboozled um but i haven't got any replies back from him so but you know what twitter's like you know it's impossible hold, having you know having a conversation with anyone there so but essentially what i'm saying is i've lost my mind and um <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just hanging around on twitter trying to interest people in this really shit quiz show idea that i've done that sounds like a good use of time to be fair mr bendel a very good use of time 
Possibly. Right. T- time will tell, Zoe. <laughs> <laughs> Cut to this time next year. You know, who knows? I can't wait to hear how it all unfolds. Um, I've got some questions here. I'm going to have to put my spectacles on. Okay. Uh, right. So the first question is from Robin Heath. And Robin says, there seems to be very little existing footage of live cleaners' performances. Where did the Summer in a Small Town clip come from? And could there be more out there somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, God. You know, it's, it's so long since I kind of made the, put the, the footage in there. And I, I can't remember where it's from. I did know um but yeah there's hardly any live footage and I was trying to track down some other footage that did exist and I spent a couple of months tracking that down and it wasn't available but that's the really interesting thing about the band the fact that they didn't gig and Mm. you know just to see um you know what there is is kind of really interesting uh when you know other bands there's just untold amounts of footage like knocking around so yeah, so I didn't really answer the question very well, but yeah, uh, yeah. good, all good. I mean, uh, right, what have we got next? Spectacles on. Sadie Gray Rogers asks: <laughs> Did Martin and Robin Hitchcock ever do any work or projects together? Considering they both also worked with Andy Partridge. Um. Ah, oh, that's that's a really good question. Um, I know, I'm pretty sure Martin um, has met Robin Hitchcock and um, there is some kind of connection, but I can't really, I can't really remember it. Um, I mean, I wanted, I know Robin is aware of Martin and I wanted him to be in the documentary, but um he didn't get back to my messages <laughs> a bit like a few people like Richard Osman yes. and um yeah so Sadie I'm really sorry I, I can't really answer that one very well uh but it's interesting I'll look into it I'll I'll, I'll, I'll get back to her somehow well Sadie has another question which also kind of doubles up with it with another a couple of people have asked this by the way uh why did Captain Sensible not participate in this documentary and she adds and I'm not talking about here, Starmer Graham. <laughs> I assume must mean, well, that's between oh, you. But. <laughs> good old Sadie. Yeah. Um, Captain Sensible, I asked him a few times and he said that he, um, well, he, was, he seemed a little bit curt. He said like he really hates the process of filming. I think it was because he was in that damned, well, he was in, you know, he was in the film about the damned. Right that um and i I, maybe i got from his uh, response that maybe it was a bit draining or maybe he was like asked uh, he was filmed a lot and maybe he was just a bit fed up with the whole filming process and but to me i kind of felt well you know I'm, i'm making a film about someone and they could really do with your endorsement and it would mean the world if you and I, I, you know, I was saying, look, I'll come down to where you live. I'll come down and it will take 15 minutes. It will be the easiest thing in the world. And, um, yeah, he didn't contribute to, it, contribute to it. And I felt really angry about it. But, um, you know, it's not his fault. He's busy. He's got other things to do. But, um, you know, he did, like, there was a, an Uncut magazine article which he contributed to. Um, you know, he, they phoned him up or whatever. And he, he, he said nice things about Martin because... Actually, you know, oh, talking of regrets, there is one thing that I <laughs> I didn't include in the film, but then I put in and then I took out um, about how Martin used to write for Captain Sensible. Oh. And I was going to put that in, but then I thought, well, because the original film didn't have it, I thought, you know what, I'm going to, if it's a mistake or if it's something I, I didn't include, I'm going to keep it the original version as it is. And then I just didn't bother saying it. And I think there was another reason why I didn't bother mentioning that. And I can't remember what it was. <laughs> so, yeah. 
judgment calls sometimes on these things as well and as you say you know sometimes with you know you hear something from one person it sounds really great and you include it and then the film comes out and someone says that didn't happen actually and it's like well, <laughs> one person's word against somebody else's yeah. and everyone's memories of the same events can be yeah, quite but can, possible, I just, you know? can i just add very quickly i mean I, i'm a massive damned fan i mean you know i first got into them when i was about 10 the first album I got was the the Black album. It was one of the first cassettes I ever got. So I was, you know, Matt, and I think that's why I was like kind of felt a bit disappointed that he didn't, you know, because I was such a big Damned fan, and I'd seen, you know, I used to go to them to see them when I was like fourteen, and you know, because he didn't appear in the the documentary, I just felt a bit let down, really. So yeah, anyway, enough of that. Let's get past it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not yet, because uh, we have a question from Paul Rose, who also uh, echoed that question about Captain Sensible. Uh, but he, he did say, you know, Paul says, uh, where, why were so many people reluctant to appear in the film? Obviously, it's something that you flag up quite honestly uh, in the movie. Yeah, well, um, I mean, say in, say, like Anton Newcomb of the Brian Jonestown Massacre, he really did want to be in it. And I, and I actually went down to Brighton. I stayed there for two nights in a hotel room and um I, I tried you know the interview was postponed to another night or another hour or whatever and uh and then in the end i think he was ill at that point and he had and he was doing a gig a gig in brighton and i think he had to just you know use all his energy for the gig mm -hmm. and i could understand that but <laughs> i was really pissed off having to go back to london without getting the interview in the bag um there was lots i mean andy partridge you know i don't know some people say is it a bit of a recluse or whatever but um i don't know there's a, a few people didn't appear in it um some people didn't get back i mean our stevie moore he he's in america he was going to be on skype or something like that but he um he because of ill health at the time he couldn't be in it so um yeah and i i kind of made a point of of saying who couldn't be in it because all my other documentaries had loads and loads of endorsements and, you know, you're putting the artists in the cultural context. And I kind of wanted to do that with Martin, but I couldn't in the end because, no, and then no one would appear. So me and Martin and his manager or, or Lol, we all decided, you know what, let's not have any of these celebrities in. Let's just have Martin centre stage. But then guess who comes along and ruins it? Uh, Stuart Moxham from the Young Marble Giants. He emailed me and said, oh, I'd missed your email this uh, from a few months back. I really want to appear in the documentary, but I thought, well, I don't want any new musical celebrities. It's just going to be about Martin with no one endorsing him. But then I love the young marble giant. So there's no way on earth. I wasn't going to have Stuart Moxham in it. So, and, and he's brilliant. Um, he's a lovely bloke. So we put him in it and uh, yeah, but there, yeah, there's lo lots of people I would have liked I don't know. I, th I think that it worked better because there weren't all these endorsements because Martin could really flourish. And he, I mean, he can talk for England. He's a total raconteur and he's, you know, he's absolutely charming. Uh, so I think that was um, maybe an act of serendipity that. I agree. I have to say, I mean, I, I, I really feel like it, it, it actually works beautifully just as it is. I don't need all these talking heads and, you know, no disrespect, but um, sometimes it can detract. And especially if you actually have, the person that you're making the film about you know you don't really need anyone else it's it's a chance to hear from them i think and i think you pitched it just just great and it worked out you know as you say sometimes you just have to go with the flow and it's serendipity isn't it uh news just in by the way or should i say newell's just in um just had a, a message on my magical information machine uh telling me that martin is watching and he said he met robin hitchcock hitchcock a number of times so that's uh just referring back to an earlier question there. Uh, and also, the, the footage uh, that was in question was from Wivenhoe Mayfair 1987. Oh. There you go. So thank you. Thank you, Martin. And good evening, Martin. It's very nice <laughs> to have your company. <laughs> I'm slightly nervous now. <laughs> um, I have another uh, two more questions for you from uh, the audience. Uh, the latest is from Steph Galvin, uh, who says, Graham, how did you meet Martin and when did you first hear the cleaners? Have you ever seen them live? I suppose we sort of answered the, the middle question, but how did you meet Martin and have you ever seen them live? Well, um, no, I haven't, I haven't seen them live, but I met Martin after I decided we were going to make the documentary. And I think the first time I met Martin was actually when I first filmed him 
so I, I went down to Wivenhoe and um, yeah, just took my camera along and uh, yeah, we started making the documentary just there and then. Yeah. Yeah. Did like a couple of hours filming and that, that was um, the first time I met him. Wow. And Immediate, like straight into yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. There wasn't any kind of introduction. Well, I think we had a, you know, we had a long phone conversation Um, you know, so he was kind of, you know, well, not sussing me out, but just kind of trying to see if I was like the right person to make the film about him. And uh, maybe, and I was like trying to think, do I want to make a film about him? Because I didn't know what he was like. And yeah. And then, I, you know, after talking to him, you kind of think, yeah, I want to make a film about him because <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's just so kind of witty and like uh, entertaining. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so Steph, um, yeah, no, I haven't seen them live and uh yeah so I, ho I hope i answered steph's um i i kind of know of steph a bit and he's, he's a great photographer so hi steph and uh i think he enjoyed the film as well how could you not frankly uh we have an oh we have another question from paul rose uh who asks graham had you read martin's autobiographies or did you purposefully avoid them um no, I, I I did I did read um, his autobiography, and that kind of informed a certain amount of the film. But yeah, I know I, sometimes it's good to kind of do your own thing and avoid that. But I, I really felt like I wanted to learn more about him. I wanted to kind of you know know what makes him tick and get a little bit under his skin. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I felt that I, I wanted to read more about him and I read his writing and various things. So I just wanted to kind of get a feel for who he was. And, you know, I, I like to try and get under the skin of the uh, the artist in a, in a way. Um, so, yeah, yeah I, I did. I did read the autobiography and a, a very good it was as well. Fair enough. Well, I think um, the uh, the sort of the... The movie fairies are telling me that we are out of time this evening, uh, but I gather that we're going to hear some music, uh, oh, yeah. some of your selections, some of your choice cuts, Graham. Yeah, well, um, the first song uh, would be Factory Boy, and that was the first song I ever heard of them in Reckless Records that day. And so that's a very significant song. And after that is a song for Sid Barrett which is brilliant, but it's very hard to choose just two songs because they're, you know, he's on so many amazing songs, but yeah. So two very significant songs. Fabulous. Well, we're going to hear them, hear them imminently, I think, but yes. I'm going to take this opportunity to say thank you, Graham. It's been great talking to you and love the film. Oh, it's thank you very much, Zoe. Um, and uh, everyone grab the chance to watch it on Doc and Roll TV before, I think, is, is it 24 hours left? Yes, 24 hours yeah. left. So, yeah, thanks a million to both of you. That was a great discussion. And uh, we had really good engagement online and Facebook. So, yeah, it went down really well by the looks of it. Thanks, right. thanks guys. So, listen, have a lovely evening. I'm going to play out with those two tunes now. And, yeah, take care. Cheers, guys. Okay. Thanks, Zoe. Thanks. Thanks, 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 Doc and Roll. Cheers. <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs>